Welcome back. This is the Unit 1 note video number 4. We are going to finish up the scientific method. So we've done step 1, ask a question. Step 2, make a hypothesis. Step 3, do the experiment. And the whole last video is on step 4, graphing and analyzing your data. So the final step, the fifth step, is making your conclusion taking that information and those patterns in that data and actually bringing it to an idea. So anytime that you do the last part of the scientific method, you should always start with deciding if your data supports or refutes your hypothesis. So you have your hypothesis. You have that if-then-because statement. You have the if I do this, then this will happen because of this. So if it supports it, if the if-then actually happened, then your because might be right. If your if-then didn't happen, then your because is definitely not right. It's wrong. So it could either maybe be right or definitely not right. Those are your two choices. Now, something that is always going to be worth points anytime you do a conclusion you always have to reference your data. You can think about this like what you do in English class when you do your evidence-based explanations for papers whenever we're teaching how to you know, do this, the English PSSAs and things like that. You have to pull things from the reading to support your statements in pretty much any English paper that you're doing. Well, in science, you do the exact same thing. You have to pull numbers from your data tables and pull spots from your graphs that support, that go along with um, what, you're, what it is that you're trying to say. So here is a conclusion to this experiment. The data taken in this experiment, well, step one, does it support or refute? Well, if we look at the graph, the fertilized plants actually did grow taller, the line is steeper, there was a faster rate of growth, so it supports the hypothesis that fertilizer contains a secret growth chemical. The chemical doesn't work immediately though. If you look at the graph, it suggests that fertilized plants grow more rapidly than unfertilized plants when. Go ahead and flip back and look, and, and look at that graph. Um, they grow the same speed, they grow the same speed, they grow the same speed, and then the two lines diverge and that's where I'm claiming is the point that the fertilizer starts working, and that is on day six. So this would be a nice conclusion. I reference some data, I say that it supports, and not only that, it's also really important in your conclusion to actually kind of restate your hypothesis again. Um, so we think that it grows better because of the secret growth, growth chemicals. So um, that should always kind of be there in the beginning. So, full disclosure, by the way, fertilizer doesn't work better because of a secret growth chemical. So a good conclusion, especially if you're writing a lab report, um, it, it's the most important part of the experiment because it's where you're showing an understanding of the patterns that you've come up with. So, also, if you don't have a good lab report, if you don't have a good conclusion and a good procedure and good data, nobody else would actually be able to repeat your experiment. And remember in science that if somebody can't repeat your experiment and get the same results, you will never be considered right. So when you do a conclusion in a lab report, these are the steps that I want you to keep in mind. Now, this, is, this would be a pretty advanced conclusion. Um, this would be a kind of conclusion that you would write, we'll say, in a college lab report. So if I was teaching freshman bio at Pitt, freshman bio lab at Pitt, um, this is what I would look for in a structure for a conclusion. So think about what kind of a conclusion you would write and then look at what this conclusion would look like and you can kind of see where or how you need to develop the skills that you're doing already. So, first question. 
do all of the trials give similar results? If the, if the data results were everywhere and all over the place, then your conclusion's probably not going to be pretty not not going to be very valid because the, you're not going to find a trend in, in your data. Um, but if they're all giving really tight, close results, that probably means the accuracy of your measurements is really good. So that's going to strengthen your conclusion. And then, does the data support or refute the hypothesis? Go on and actually explain why it supports the hypothesis. Explain what parts of the data are the most important to look at that really hit home with whether or not it supports or refutes. And then, go on and actually talk about if anything happened in your experiment um, that you didn't consider ahead of time. This is, this is important because of that next level when you start doing real science where other people are going to copy your experiment and verify it. There are scientists who that's their entire career. They, they repeat other people's experiments and actually help determine if they're right or not. Um, so the, those are people you never learn about their names, but they're, that's the heart and soul of, of science. If that didn't happen, we wouldn't have science. <coughs> So if you actually say in your conclusion something that you didn't think about ahead of time, that would only help the next person that was going to do the experiment, something for them to watch out for, maybe a speed bump or a, a hole in the road that they, that they could avoid hitting. And then if your data supports your hypothesis and, and now there's a chance that your hypothesis might actually be the way the world works, talk about how that might be useful, how, how we could apply this information. Or, if it refutes, come up with another explanation that would explain those observations that you had in step one. So, the scientific method is a cycle. There's a feedback loop. When we talked about systems, remember? When you get to the end, that's not the end. It actually can kick back to the beginning if your output is not what your input is supposed to turn into. And then you can list some new questions. So, if when you get to the point, if you continue in science, and you go to college and you're writing lab reports, this is the structure that you're going to want to ultimately get to when you are doing lab reports and actually just legit labs to, to be a published scientific author. There's a big star spinning on your screen because this is really important. Just because the results from your, hypoth from your experiment were supported that does not mean that your hypothesis is true. I see students write this all the time. They will say, they will start their conclusion off with, our, our hypothesis was true, or is true. No, no, never. Your hypothesis can actually never, ever, 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 ever be proven true. You can never prove a hypothesis true. This is a really big misunderstanding that students have just in science in general, you can prove a hypothesis wrong. That's easy. Proving one true is impossible. And remember, no one will even accept the results until somebody else can verify them and get the same things. And then the more people that verify the results, the more likely that your hypothesis is the way the world works is true, but you can never actually be sure. And it's because of the because. And I think that that's, that's why students have a hard time conceptualizing this idea because before this class, <clears throat> you were allowed to have your hypotheses be an if-then statement. Well, that's something that you can prove. If I pull the pendulum up this high, then it will swing this far. You can do that every time. That seems like you're proving it. But when you put that because aspect in there, it changes everything. If I pull the pendulum up this far, then it will swing this far because I'm staring at it really hard. Well, your data would support what you were saying, and it would support the fact now, instead of it having to do with the physics of the way levers work with gravity, um, it's the because is because I'm staring at it and I'm moving it with my mind. All right? So it's... That, that because aspect that I want you guys to start adding in there makes it so you can never actually know if the because is what's causing your outcome. But the more times that it works out, the more likely that it's right. 
So let's say we have our hypothesis and it's supported and the next person comes along and does it and it's supported and the next person comes along and does it and it's supported and the next person comes along and does it and it's supported. What does a hypothesis turn into if it's never refuted? Well, it can turn into two things. It can turn into a theory or a law. Now this last part of this video is something that many, many, many science, uh, science teachers um, teach incorrectly. It was the most mistaught thing in science for a long time. People are getting much better at understanding it now. Uh, <coughs> but for a long time, this was really poorly taught. So a hypothesis can turn into a theory or it can turn into a law. And it all depends on what the hypothesis is about. If it turns, if, if the hypothesis is explaining why something occurs, if it's explaining like why when it gets, when, when the environment changes to be more cold that the creatures that end up surviving end up with thicker fur. If you're explaining why that would happen, then it's a theory. And that's why we have something like the theory of evolution. If it is explaining what will happen in any, whoops, I hit the wrong button. If it's explaining what would happen in a given situation, like if I climb to the top of the tower and I let go of this ball, what will happen? The ball will fall. That is explained by something we call a law the law of gravity. So if it's explaining what will happen, it turns into a law. If it's explaining why something happens, it turns into a theory. And here is the part that most students get that they maybe never realized before. Which of these is better? Most of the time, if you ask that question to a person, especially an adult, they will tell you that a law is better than a theory. And that is completely, completely wrong. In fact, neither is better than the other. The reason neither is better than the other is because they're two different things. And most adults, when they were in school, were taught that if a, if a hypothesis lasted long enough, that it would turn into a theory. And if the theory lasted long enough, then it would turn into a law. And that is just not the way science works. That is very wrong. A theory will never turn into a law because theories and laws are two different things. It doesn't get any better than a theory in science. A theory is the best that a hypothesis can become if it explains why something happens. A law is the best that a hypothesis can become if it explains what happens. So anytime that you see arguments when people say something like, that's just a theory. That is a terrible argument because it doesn't get any better than a theory. Here's a young Mr. Regal in school. <laughs> and again, another graphic that actually illustrates the wrong way that people, that people sometimes think science works. All right. Booby trap number four. There's only six questions on this one. Um, so we'll see you in class.